Okay, everyone, good morning. Uh, this is Jack Van Horn from the uh, BD2K Training Coordinating Center based at the University of Southern California, and I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to the next in our, in our series of uh, Big Data to Knowledge Guide to the Fundamentals of Data Science. Uh, today, we're going to be hearing from uh, Dr. Zachary Ives from the University of Pennsylvania. He's going to be discussing data provenance, challenges, benefits, and research. Uh, Dr. Ives is a professor of computer and information science at the University of Pennsylvania, as well as the newly appointed associate dean for master's and professional programs at the University of Penn's School of Engineering and Applied Science. Uh, he's the co-founder of Blackfin Incorporated, which is a company focused on enabling life sciences research and discovery through data integration. And his research interests include data integration, sharing, management of big data, sensor network Works, data provenance and uh, authoritativeness. Uh, he's the recipient of an NSF Career Award and an alumnus of the DARPA Computer Science Study Panel and Information Science and Technology Advisory Panels. He's co-authored textbooks, many influential articles, and uh, we're absolutely uh, delighted to hear about uh, his work on data provenance, that is the attaching of metadata, but also um, by whom that uh, data comes from, under what conditions, the processing steps that were used, uh, and all the things that we call provenance. So, uh, Zachary, thank you very much for joining us. We really look forward to your lecture. Great. Thanks very much, Jack, and thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, as Jack said, uh, I have worked on a variety of topics broadly related to um, kind of the computational support for bringing together data from many places. Um, and of course, once you start to integrate and reuse data, um, all sorts of questions arise about where the original data came from and how it was assembled and so on. And so, you know, I see provenance as a key part not only of data science, but especially of data science when you're trying to share and reuse data. So my goal today is to try to give kind of a high-level overview of the main uh, abstractions and models for how we think about provenance, uh, some of the benefits of provenance, some of the open challenges, and a little bit of a hint at uh, where a lot of the open problems and the active research is in this space. Uh, I should probably note as I uh, go into this that the NIH BD2K program is currently funding uh, three different efforts in the data provenance space. Uh, so there's our group at Penn, uh, there's a group uh, out of uh, Case Western and a group out of Duke, uh, and we're all trying to kind of work together in a coordinated fashion to make uh, services that might be reusable across uh, kind of the broader uh, BD2K portfolio. So with that, um, let me see if I can uh, actually dive in a little bit into why we actually care about provenance. Um, as I do that, I should probably emphasize um, there are actually several different terms used for roughly the same ideas. So I think the sort of standard at this point is data provenance. Um, and in fact, to the, my best knowledge, the, the term was actually coined by my uh, former colleague uh, Peter Buneman here at, at Penn. Um, but other people have called it data lineage, data pedigree, and so on. And in some sense, really, it's an expanded version of uh, kind of the scientific record and the way we uh, describe our experimental methodology and, and so on. Um, so as you, you know, think about a process like what's visualized on the slide where we go from data acquisition to data analysis to generating figures and reports and, and papers, all along the way we'd like to record in as much detail as we can the processes, the assumptions, the um, sample size, the sample settings, et cetera, uh, that went into the creation of each of the data products along the way, okay? And, you know, when you look at that, at the very earliest stage, the leftmost, the data acquisition side, what we tend to think about as provenance is things like who did the experiment, under what instrument settings, uh, and, and what the context was. Um, this is largely uh, kind of metadata that we need to carefully define. As we move from acquisition of the raw data from the real world, there typically are a lot of computational steps performed. You know, you run a piece of code with an algorithm. Uh, so there we tend to think about data provenance as something that might, for instance, be automatically created, maintained, and logged by the computer system itself uh, as you're writing 
uh, as you're running your code and, and so on. Okay, so there's a fairly different way we think about provenance at the first stage versus the second stage, because the first stage is primarily figuring out what you want to capture. The second stage is something that you can imagine computationally supporting and automating, and I'll get into more detail about that um, as we go forward. With respect to why provenance, um, obviously one of the big motivations for uh, data provenance is support for reproducibility and validation of results. Uh, the more documentation we have on exactly what was done, the more detail we can understand how to repeat uh, the same results. But, in fact, increasingly we're starting to put value on other uses of provenance. Uh, so one of the most important that I've uh, looked at in my computer science research uh, is if you have data from many different providers, ultimately we can use data provenance and past history and uh, reliability and uh, so on to actually use provenance to reason about how much you as an individual user might want to trust or rank or look at a particular data source. So really uh, the reliability, relevance, or value of data may also depend very much on its provenance. Okay. Um, so we, we tend to think of that generically as trust, but it really encompasses lots of different things. Um, another key place where provenance comes into play all the time is if I am bringing together data that was acquired under different conditions, uh, as I'm trying to regularize it and harmonize it in order to conduct some kind of analysis, uh, I may have to process data from different sources in different ways. And that processing might involve more than just converting the formats, which you typically do in the data wrangling stage. It might also involve regularizing it in some particular way uh, particularly paying, in, paying attention to things like which populations were uh, studied in the different, um, uh, the different sources and so on. Okay, so data provenance helps us not just reproduce but also uh, evaluate and select and assign trustworthiness to data. And finally, if we look at data provenance and we have a bird's eye perspective of what data sources are used where, then in fact, much like we do with social networks and the World Wide Web and so on, we can use, for instance, information about how often a data source is used to uh, give some indications about how authoritative or useful or relevant that particular data source would be. So you can think of something analogous to the H index or to Google PageRank or whatever being applied to data sources if we have visibility through data provenance. Okay, so lots of different reasons to use it. Um, I want to stress uh, that data provenance and data uh, are really going to be tightly linked in our worldview all the time, even though we tend to think of data and metadata as separate things. Obviously, this is a kind of metadata that's extremely useful in understanding how to interpret a given piece of data. Okay, so that's the basic overview of what I want to talk about today. Um, now what I'm going to do is kind of drill down a little bit to more formally explain what provenance needs to be. Uh, so we'll spend a bit of time on that and then I'll kind of go through how we actually model it uh, computationally with tools and then some of the applications. So starting with the formal definition, uh, let's sort of separate into two camps. As I said, one of the kinds of data provenance is provenance over data as we're acquiring it. So for instance, you know, in the figure here we have an MRI machine. Uh, we might need to annotate the individual images or the set of images uh, with information about what the instrument settings were, who did the the actual experiment or data acquisition, potentially who the subject was, what experiment was being done, and so on. Okay, And if you think of the classic questions of who, what, where, when, why, and how, basically what we're trying to do is capture all of those. Uh, the environment, the context, the questions, etc. Okay, All of this is ultimately fairly domain specific. It will depend on uh, what the experiments are about, uh, but 
it does involve some piece of capturing data from the instrument itself, and it may involve some additional data entry from the uh, people actually doing the data acquisition. So one of the big challenges here is, at some level, data provenance, if you think of it as an explanation of exactly why you are doing some particular data acquisition, can be an extremely, extremely detailed record of what you've done before and a justification for what you're doing now. Um, we never want to make provenance capture too much of a burden. So the question is just how much of this context needs to be captured. And I think uh, here, when we think about data provenance, the key challenge is trying to decide exactly what kind of metadata we're going to capture that sort of balances between how hard it is and how much manual labor is involved versus the level of detail capture that might help somebody else in the future reinterpret and reuse our data. So this first stage is really primarily a metadata design problem as opposed to a computational tools problem. We have to think about things like uh, how much of the context of the data acquisition can we get, how much is actually going to be useful in the future. Um, certainly one of the big questions, especially with uh, modern sensors and data acquisition devices is, you know, if we can capture a lot of that context automatically where a human doesn't have to do anything, uh, that's extraordinarily helpful. And there are lots and lots of examples of uh, this happening in practice. Uh, you know, my collaborators who do high throughput gene sequencing, there's a lot of um, parameter information that comes out of that machine. Um, whenever you take a digital photo on your smartphone, uh, there's the so-called EXIF data that includes all sorts of information about the settings and potentially even GPS and so on. Um, increasingly, people are looking at using NFC or barcodes or various other things to automatically capture uh, their setup in the, in the real world so that nobody has to manually type in or even worse, handwrite in uh, the metadata. So in general, lots of questions here uh, with no uh, sort of standardized across the world, across domain uh, guidelines, but rather some general rules of thumb on what you're trying to capture. However, there are also lots of standards available at this point for capturing, for what to capture and what fields and how to name them and what units with respect to this initial data acquisition. And so for instance, uh, one of the uh, standards bodies that uh, our group interacts with quite often is, is OpenM Health. Uh, they have a set of predefined fields for a lot of kinds of data acquisition tasks uh, that they've tried to standardize across the community. Um, generally here, this is a standards effort that focuses on particular domains. Technology can help, for instance, by automating capture, but much like database design, the key tasks here are human intensive and um, involve kind of capturing the experimental setup. Okay, where the more computational and software support can come in is when we kind of switch from that initial data acquisition to later processing of the data. So what I have here in the slide is a very simple uh, sort of sketch of some kind of gene sequence uh, capture and alignment uh, job where we might start off on the left with uh, gene sequence information from initial data acquisition, uh, which was captured with some additional metadata, going through these two red boxes that represent computational steps. For instance, in a Python script, first one might filter out um, low quality sequence information. The second one uh, might be actually trying to align the gene sequences against some reference genome uh, producing some set of alignments. So as we look at this, there are multiple computational steps. There was provenance in terms of metadata attached to the original sequence data. Now the question is, what do we attach to the output of the quality filter? What do we attach to the output of the aligner? And ideally, can we build tools that help us do that automatically? And then ultimately, once we've captured it, can we build tools that help us to reason about and make use of this kind of provenance uh, metadata. So conceptually, what we want to do is take those computational steps and essentially create a trace or a log of 
here are the individual steps. Each step uh, involved certain inputs. It had certain parameters. It produced a certain output. Uh, so schematically, on the right, you see kind of a list of steps, like read a particular file, do some computation like sorting rows, do some computation, for instance, like computing a median, do some computation like writing to a file. That is a kind of an example of what we might want to capture uh, to document our computational processes. And then, of course, we want to attach it to our output. So from a tooling perspective, what we want is, for instance, to be able to run a script that automates the production of output results from input files, and we want to potentially store that output either in the file system or in a database. And effectively, on the side, what we'd like is something equivalent to a provenance database system whose content will also link closely to the file, as we kind of schematically see uh, in the right hand of the figure. Again, we need to be able to reason about provenance and data together because we will often want to assess the data or interpret the data based on its linked provenance annotations. Okay, so conceptually, it's a simple problem. Of course, when you try to actually uh, break it down into solvable steps, it ends up getting a little more complicated. Okay, so let's start with the simple kind of obvious first take at it. I'll describe why we need to slightly tweak that uh, and then uh, where that ultimately has taken the data provenance community. So the simplest form of captured data provenance is, again, during our initial data acquisition, uh, as we read data from an instrument, we'll attach to the file specific metadata tags and values, for instance, about uh, the experiment and the configuration and the date of acquisition and the subject and whatever else uh, is relevant to our particular um, experiment. Then as we support computational processing, we could build some kind of service that essentially captures all of the events that the computer is uh, handling as it, for instance, launches a program, opens a file, writes to another file, reads from another file, starts another script, and so on and so forth. Okay, so we can kind of monitor program execution, capture the program-specific events or tasks, feed it to some logging service, and then put it into uh, an event log, which we might think of as a kind of primitive provenance database. Okay, and in fact, in the computer science world, there are a lot of different research efforts that have been undertaken using exactly this model. Um, probably the most well-known uh, was Margot Seltzer's work at Harvard on a system called PASS, which basically uh, updated the operating system to record all of the individual steps in uh, uh, reading and writing to files. Okay. And in fact, more recently, my own group has built a uh, system we call Provenance Tracker, which I'll talk about in more detail later, which does something similar without changing the operating system. It, it essentially captures all of the data processing uh, steps in terms of jobs being run and inputs and outputs, uh, and then it makes it accessible uh, for the future. Okay, so there are lots of tools for doing this. The nice thing about these tools is they capture all the individual steps, the inputs and outputs automatically. We don't have to worry about a human entering uh, all of that information. Okay. There also is a very related thing that happens at pretty much every internet company and any large uh, enterprise, uh, which is very close to provenance, but people tend to not think of it that way, which is as they process data, they record logs and logs and logs of requests, for instance, from the web server, of individual queries handled, of individual steps performed, all of that stuff is really capturing the kind of data provenance, um, but it's being done in a fairly ad hoc way, okay? And in general, for all of these log-based approaches, if I just take the output of whatever the computer actually captures, it's generally too low to be tremendously useful for these questions of reproducibility and these questions of trustworthiness and reliability and impact. Um, and the reason is it captures all the micro-level steps that uh, 
a piece of software read 64 bytes from one file and wrote 32 bytes to another file and all sorts of information about sequential steps that may not matter. It's basically very, very low level at the level of the operating system reasons about things rather than the level that we would like to think about uh, as experimentalists and so forth. Okay. So what we'd like to do is lift from these sort of chronological steps in a log to something that says this thing was produced because somebody in particular ran it using the following steps and so on. It's really about causal relationships, not individual chronological steps. And the kinds of questions we want to ask are generally about relationships between the individual components that were processed, created, etc. Okay, so this is going to motivate us to kind of rethink our level of abstraction. If this is too low level, can we come up with something higher level? Okay. Second big problem is that in general, these logs get really, really irregular. It's hard to process logs from different software artifacts because they just end up looking completely different. So a second goal as we think about provenance is we need a standard way of capturing provenance no matter where it came from, what systems, etc. Okay. So summary of this first part, provenance, we can break it into two main components. The first is taking raw data, capturing the who, what, where, why, and how. This is primarily a data design and then ultimately a human plus automated data entry task. This step is, of course, extraordinarily important, uh, but in many data science scenarios, what we will end up sharing and reusing may not be the raw data. It might be some kind of derived data. So our focus, and especially the focus of computer scientists like me, uh, is on computational support for provenance on derived data. And this is really about capturing the individual steps, the inputs, the conditions, and so on for each of the processing stages and really describing not just fields but relationships among the individual data products. Ideally, we do this completely automatically, transparently invisible to the scientist. Um, in the worst case, we will do it semi-automatically with the scientist potentially helping out a little bit with providing extra details. Okay. Other big piece is we want to make sure that any computational support here has standards uh, and a way that provenance is captured generically, but that it's also extensible so that specific field, specific metadata can be added for a given domain. Um, finally, it's worth noting our goals, again, are reproducibility, assessment of quality, harmonization, and so forth. So, Let's now take kind of the goals from this first segment and look at how we might refine the straw man approach into something a little more uh, suitable for reasoning about. Uh, and coming from the database community, we tend to think a lot about uh, data models, uh, like the relational data model or a graph data model. Similarly, what we want here is a provenance data model or a provenance model, and that's basically what we're going to be talking about next. So broadly, if we look at what we're trying to capture in data provenance, there are really three main components. Uh, there are entities which are the things that are being manipulated. So typically that could be something like a data file or a data object within a file uh, or a data object within a data stream from a sensor. Somehow or other, you have these things being fed into processing steps, and as a result, other entities are being produced. Okay, so the first step, first component is entities. The second thing is some of the entities, for instance, um, pieces of code, uh, might be run as tasks and might be used to process data. So we have this generic idea of activities. Some of the activities might be processed by humans. So, you know, uh, conducting some particular uh, manual step in processing is definitely an activity and we might want to abstract that. 
And obviously, a lot of the activities are going to be running software artifacts, which really are, at some level, binary files with particular versions and timestamps and so on. We're going to be running those and processing uh, input entities or files using particular parameters. So activities really represent not a piece of code or a particular um, uh, kind of noun in the system, but rather the act of doing some task, either computationally or manually. And then finally, we have agents who typically are people. Right, The activities are going to be invoked by the people. Um, but sometimes also you will have situations where a person starts one particular computational job that then spawns a bunch of others. So agents can be both humans, but they can also be other tasks that then go on and invoke still other tasks and so on. Okay? So agents basically start activities, or put the other way, activities are usually conducted on behalf of or by agents. Activities typically read entities and write entities, or more, more generically, they have uh, entities that they process in order to produce other entities. So on the bottom of this slide, we have a figure which shows, again, our um, kind of gene sequencing uh, example uh, where we see sequence data, which is an entity. Uh, it's annotated by metadata. Oops. Uh, sorry, uh, and at the next step we have a, this ellipse represents the quality check activity, which has some parameters and in fact not shown here. Uh, the quality check presumably also links to the particular file that is the the program being run. The quality check is being performed by uh, our user. So here we have the little kind of house symbol with with Bill Nye, the science guy, in it. Perhaps he ran uh, the quality check code. The output of that will be these filtered sequences, uh, which again is an entity. Uh, then we run an aligner, which takes the filtered sequences and a reference genome as input entities, and it produces alignments. That's essentially an abstract representation of provenance. And in fact, I'm broadly following the notation of one of the standards that we're going to talk about in a moment. One thing that's kind of interesting about the standard is that the arrows point in the opposite direction of data flow. So uh, if you read this diagram initially, you may uh, get the impression that data is going from right to left. But in fact, in general, these um, the edges, the lines, and the arrows represent uh, sort of uh, where things came from as opposed to where data was fed. So uh, we're really looking at the alignments were created by the aligner, which read as an input the filtered sequences. More generically, this standard, which at this point uh, has had a lot of input from many different constituencies and has become the standard for data provenance, uh, is called ProvDM, the Provenance Data Model. Uh, it's standardized by the World Wide Web Consortium, and it's actually one of a family of provenance standards. Um, it basically defines a syntax, an abstract representation, uh, and a basic vocabulary for core aspects of data provenance. And so you'll sort of see in the table on the uh, left this notion of entities, activities, and agents that I had used in the previous example. Underneath that, there is a series of relationships between these entities, activities, and agents. So things like something was generated by a particular activity, or that uh, an agent used a particular uh, entity, or that one particular entity was derived from another, etc. So this is kind of a basic core vocabulary for relationships between data items. Uh, on the right, we see some examples of different views of provenance graphs describing these relationships. It's worth noting that all of the kind of white boxes in those figures uh, describe extra properties. This is metadata that's specific to the domain that the data was acquired from. Uh, so these are the metadata fields that you would customize for your particular 
uh, experiment or uh, data modality or uh, data types. Um, PROV tries to give a basic core for describing entities, activities, agents, and relationships and assumes that you will augment all of that with additional domain-specific fields uh, that hopefully will be propagated in a straightforward way from inputs to outputs and so on. Okay, so that's the basic core uh, way of capturing provenance in a general way that is also extensible. And in many ways, I like to make the analogy, uh, even though it's not an exact one, that one should think of ProvDM uh, much the way one thinks of standards like XML or JSON or RDF, which is to say there is a core syntax that helps us share a lot of the basic concepts, but ultimately there will be extra fields, metadata, and relationships that you will need to define and add as you go. Just to give some hint on how Prov uh, DM is actually uh, entered into the computer, there are several different formats. One of them is called Prov N. It's designed to be fairly human readable. So what we see in the example here is the definition of a bunch of entities. Uh, so the first one is uh, the first entity is some kind of article, and we're assigning uh, particular metadata fields like a title. Uh, to that particular entity. Those things that you see before the colons, the EXN and the DC terms and so on, are uh, part of uh, what's called a namespace. It's a place where individual terms are uh, being defined, uh, for instance, within an ontology or within a, a particular schema. So for the most part, you can kind of ignore that prefix and just read this as it's, we're defining an entity which is an article and it has a title being crime rises in cities. We have similar definitions here for data set one and region list and so on. There is also an XML equivalent format for those uh, who are building tools. Um, as you can hopefully get from the example, it's much less human readable, um, but the advantage to XML is that there are many, many tools that automatically uh, generate, parse, and read it. Okay, so that's what provenance looks like ultimately. Uh, there's this kind of abstract model of graphs between users, agents, and activities. And then there's this more syntactic model, which is just how we encode the basic objects and relationships within the graph. The next question obviously should be, we have this model. How in the world are we actually going to record, in particular, the provenance relationships? So there are really three main ways. Um, if you write a particular analytics algorithm, uh, then you know one thing that you could do, uh, although it takes a fair amount of work, would be to have the program itself not only produce the output data files, but in fact record somewhere, for instance, a bunch of ProvN or uh, ProvXML uh, records describing exactly what it did. Okay, But that's fairly labor intensive, and especially for code that already exists, uh, most people will not be particularly motivated uh, to add this extra instrumentation. So a second thing that you can do, and this has been the common practice uh, within a lot of the scientific communities, especially in areas like physics and astronomy, uh, where there are very regular um, processing workflows done, there are special platforms like Taverna and Kepler and Galaxy and VizTrails, uh, which basically allow you to define sequences of computation using uh, kind of a boxes and arrows uh, data flow module. Actually, uh, uh, the Loney uh, effort uh, also does something very similar to this, where different computational steps can be cascaded together, usually using visual tools, and these will be automatically run on a server somewhere. And many of the existing uh, workflow engines as a byproduct will automatically generate uh, data provenance to go along with the data outputs. And this is a wonderful and extremely uh, helpful capability. Um, however, there are a number of people, and I would count among that many of my collaborators, uh, who feel that a large part of their data analysis is not regular enough that they want to use a workflow system. Rather, they want to be able to go, for instance, to uh, the Python shell and run 
uh, a bunch of particular steps, or they might want to go to the Linux terminal and run different programs to uh, do some sequence of steps, and they might want to be able to change this kind of on the fly. So for these kinds of scenarios, to this point, there have not been very many answers for how to actually capture that kind of provenance. Um, in recent years, there have been a number of efforts to try to actually uh, build tools that help capture arbitrary executions of programs and scripts and so on. Um, so uh, at NYU uh, Poly, um, Juliana Ferreri's group has done a bunch of work in this space. Uh, and as I had mentioned earlier, um, our group here has also done uh, something in this space to allow for kind of a background Dropbox-like tool that just watches what you're running and records it and generates ProvDM. So I'll talk more about this again in a little bit. Okay, so that was what provenance looks like, how we actually record it. The last piece to provenance capture is where do we actually put it once we have it there. Um, again, I want to emphasize that one shouldn't really think of provenance and data as living in completely different worlds. However, we typically have a solution for where we're storing our data, and it may not be easy to gracefully extend that uh, to support provenance. So in general, the way we think of provenance storage is somewhere we ought to have kind of a provenance database, which will really be storing graphs, and there ought to be a way of having common identifiers between uh, nodes in our traditional database or data storage system and references in the provenance storage system so that we can reconstruct the links between provenance and data. Now, Often when people hear that provenance uh, and provdm are a graph, uh, we'll pretty quickly gravitate toward graph databases, so things like Neo4j and OrientDB and so on, and that's a perfectly good and viable place to put provenance. Uh, but in fact, uh, one can also encode provenance in essentially any kind of NoSQL database or relational databases where the tables would be things like entities and attributes and agents, uh, etc. So prov does not particularly prescribe what the underlying database is. Uh, however, it does pretty well prescribe what we want to store within the database. Okay, and here there are a lot of tools um, that have been built from uh, the ProvDM spec. Uh, in particular, uh, Luke Moreau, who was one of the Prov, uh, one of the core uh, leaders of the Prov movement, has a very nice Prov toolbox. Uh, in open source, um, and a variety of groups, including ours, have built expanded services over that uh, for trying to capture provenance from the community. So uh, we, for instance, have a have a server at penprovenance.net where you can just uh, upload, share, uh, and manage uh, provdm data. Okay. Um, what I described so far is looking at provenance in terms of files and uh, computational modules, so things like programs. Um, in reality, that is one piece of the broad spectrum of how computer scientists think about provenance. Um, there are a lot of efforts in trying to model provenance at a finer level of granularity than files and programs. So for instance, I might look at my file that had uh, lists of gene sequences and want to specifically describe each of those sequences uh, as a separate input entity. And I might want to think about my uh, aligner program as having individual substeps. So we tend to think of this as uh, going from treating files and programs as black boxes that we don't understand into making them kind of clear boxes or gray boxes or white boxes where you can actually uh, algorithmically reason about what's going on in terms of the individual data objects, the contents, and in terms of the individual operations. And if you go to this level of detail, which has been studied heavily in the database community and others, um, this lets you reason in much more detail about how specific results as, a, as opposed to specific files how those were produced, 
Uh, and it can also, in many cases, help diagnose why some results might be different from others and so forth. So broadly, uh, I think it's important to understand that uh, from the life sciences perspective, we'll often think about file to program to file provenance, black box provenance, uh, but there are situations where we need this lower uh, level of detail or, or finer level of detail, uh, and there are technologies for that as well. That's not going to be the focus of uh, my presentation here, uh, but there are many references uh, in that and uh, uh, in the Q&A or in other scenarios, I'm happy to talk about this in more detail. Okay, so to summarize part two, we've gone from this notion of why we want to capture provenance to the basic uh, core constructs of how people encode provenance abstractly as uh, entities, activities, and agents. We talked a bit about the ProvDM standard and the fact that it captures data flows and relationships but allows additional metadata to be attached. We talked a bit about different tools and mechanisms for capturing provenance, uh, and then we kind of highlighted the notion that actually there are also other more detailed forms of data provenance. Um, as kind of the last major segment, what I want to do is talk briefly about uh, some of the computational tasks that uh, people are doing or attempting to develop techniques to do with data provenance. So uh, one of the most common things and uh, one of the most commonly supported things that we can do is to take data items, so again files or individual records, um, and to build tools that will help um, look up the provenance of particular those particular objects uh, and visualize it so that users can sanity check, can reproduce, can identify uh, why and how a particular data item existed. Okay, so this broadly is useful for kind of sanity checking, interpretation, and so on at the uh, manual level. Um, and it's not an uncommon operation at all, especially if you want to reproduce results. Okay. But in many ways, this is the simplest thing because what it really involves is looking up the provenance, uh, the ProvDM entry for a given entity, pulling up that piece of the graph, and then running it through interactive visualization tools like the one that uh, I'm showing here uh, and a, a wide variety of uh, tools that are available to the community. Um, while we're talking about this, I should also mention uh, you know, a question may come up if you're trying to do reproducible research, uh, and especially if you're trying to authenticate a result, how do we know that what we're visualizing is actually what was uh, done? What if somebody came into our provenance database and hacked the provenance entries? Well, it turns out uh, there are a bunch of uh, pieces of work in the computer science space uh, done by my colleagues here at Penn specifically developing ways of using encryption uh, and um, so-called Merkle trees to uh, help capture the individual steps uh, and essentially authenticate that the provenance is intact and has not been forged or modified in any given way. Okay, so that's provenance and its visualization. Uh, some other things that we might want to do uh, are what I want to focus on for the last couple of minutes. I want to emphasize here that most of the things I'm going to briefly talk about are on the active research side of the world. There are some preliminary tools for many of them, um, but many of them uh, are highly dependent on exactly what level of detail we have in terms of the black box operations and how they work. Um, and because they're so dramatically affected by the individual assumptions of the operations, um, the number of tools available that are general purpose uh, is a bit more limited here. Um, so these are all areas where I think we're going to start to see more and more um, tooling and more and more options uh, as the next couple of years uh, go forward. So first piece I want to mention uh, is we might go from visualizing provenance to reproducing for reproduction to actually using provenance and automating the process of 
reproducing an experiment. So basically this involves, for instance, having a tool where the user can identify some particular data product uh, and say, can you repeat the same process that was involved in creating this data product on my new input data item over here? So this is now really taking the provenance and using it essentially to define a script to run against another new piece of data. Okay, and then we can further expand on that to say, why don't we reproduce and rerun exactly the script that was used on the previous result with one small modification. So for instance, I want to replace one of the original modules with my own module, and now I want to compare the results. So this task of automating the reproduction and ultimately comparison and benchmarking of different results uh, is something that's computationally fairly easy to do, uh, that can be incredibly effective as part of the exploration and reproduction uh, uh, repertoire for scientists. Another big piece, uh, and one of my personal interests, is this interplay between data provenance and both trustworthiness of the data and impact. Um, so I had alluded a bit to this earlier. Um, if we look at all of our data in some ProvDM graph, ultimately what will happen is certain entities will be reused in many, many, many experiments, and perhaps the results of those experiments can be reused in many, many other analyses and so on. Um, and if we have a bird's eye perspective of what's being reused, this gives us a wonderful opportunity to assign scores to impact and uh, centrality and uh, visibility of particular data items. And the same way that we tend to use things like the H index for uh, measuring scholarly impact uh, or page rank for measuring authoritativeness of websites, we can create a sharing index uh, or an impact index on data based on who is using it. And the building block to that is data provenance. Another big piece that's closely related, but now focuses on single items as opposed to uh, the entire network of relationships, is over time, <coughs> as we look at data uh, and assess whether it is correct or incorrect, we can use machine learning and other techniques to figure out between all the data items that are correct and all the data items that are incorrect, or between all the data items that are relevant and those that are irrelevant, what is it in their provenance that differentiates between the good and the bad, or the trusted and the untrusted? And over time, we can actually learn to put weights and scores and probabilities of relevance on data based purely on its provenance. So that's something that I think uh, will continue to become more and more important over time as more data becomes shared and reused uh, in more and more and more uh, experiments. Okay, uh, really the last main piece I wanted to briefly allude to is uh, provenance is also a building block toward diagnosis and debugging. Um, I have collaborators who run essentially scripts over their data on a daily basis. They're acquiring new data every day, they run a script, they produce some results. Over time they make tweaks to the script over time, they might want to do a historical comparison of their results from today versus their results from six months. And sometimes the results aren't consistent. Now the question is, how do they diagnose what changed and why? And there, absolutely, data provenance becomes critical to really identifying the differences between today's script and six months ago's script. And in fact, we can replay pieces of that those two scripts and compare them in order to ultimately help the scientists to debug what changed and potentially what went wrong uh, in their analysis. So this is something that we're very, very interested in uh, and actively working on here at Penn. Okay, one last part related to provenance that's worth emphasizing before we conclude is that um, while I talked about going from this very low level view of provenance to something more abstract, in fact, there are many possible levels of abstraction I might want to have for provenance. In some cases, I want to see each individual step. In some places, I may want to actually simplify or sort of collapse together many provenance steps into one kind of unified black box 
So one of the big tasks in sort of this view of ultimately building a Providence database or Providence support platform is we want to be able to do queries and views that actually abstract data. And a lot of work done by my colleague Susan Davidson has actually focused especially on those particular problems. So in terms of making Providence useful, we can visualize it, we can use it to measure trust and impact, we can use it to measure uh, differences between different results, and we can use it to hide and abstract pieces of Providence and give us a better perspective on what really happened. So let me wrap up now by saying I've tried to capture through the last 50 minutes why Providence is actually a hard problem and it's more than just defining a series of data acquisition parameters. Uh, we described a bit about how we model Providence abstractly, some of the tools and techniques available for capture, some of the tools and techniques available or under active study for what we can do with Providence. Um, I've mentioned along the way that um, as part of our NIH BD2K project, we've been trying to build reusable tools for the community in this space. Uh, so I'll leave a pointer up for that. Um, and I want to conclude by saying Providence is still a space that is in its early stages. There's tremendous opportunity for using this kind of metadata for reasoning about data. And uh, I'm very excited about where it's all headed. And I expect in five years, a repeat version of this webinar will end up looking dramatically different as we start to have impact. So thank you for your time, and I'm happy to uh, flip to Q&A mode uh, as, uh, as people have questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Zach. That was outstanding. So everyone, if uh, you do have some questions for uh, Dr. Ives, uh, please uh, enter them into the little question uh, functionality there that's part of the, the GoToWebinar uh, interface, probably on the right side of your screen, and uh, we'll try and get to those. Now, we've already had uh, a few of these, and uh, Zach, uh, the, one uh, person asked, uh, how much activity is going on um, with the level of manufacturers to make sure that critical provenance information, such as the firmware or the you know, make model and uh, uh, serial number of the, the scanner or the gene sequencer or whatever, is getting embedded into, uh, into raw data files so that that, so almost like, is there like a minimum information standard that's available? Uh, and are our manufacturers uh, subscribing to it? So that's a wonderful question, and I would say it's highly, highly variable by uh, communities. So, you know, it seems like there are certain uh, domains where uh, most of that information is, does seem to be getting captured. Um, I think there are also plenty of cases where it's clear that that's not all being captured. Um, you know, it feels like this is one of the things that, at the end of the day, the research community um, needs to articulate strongly uh, to the manufacturers that, you know, part of what's going to help us select your instrument will be that it uh, records all this kind of information. I suspect there are a lot of cases where people have uh, firmware that you will never see that that particular uh, firmware got changed or, or whatnot. Um, Many of the other parameters, I think, are being captured and, and are available, at least in the manufacturer's file formats. I think the other thing that's always a bit tricky is, depending on the field, sometimes uh, there is a level of detail that is output by the instruments in their proprietary file formats. Uh, but then once you export that data into some more open format, a lot of that detail tends to get dropped. Uh, so I think there's also an opportunity to think about for specific data modalities, um, are there things that we want to, you know, encourage everybody to propagate from the individual devices. Right, and you also mentioned that uh, you don't want provenance uh, to be a burden for researchers. Um, all right, and uh, with, with the exception of uh, the uh, uh, manufacturers um, helping us to do it, do you see any other way to achieve it being kind of a simple thing? Uh, for people to do, and are there any editors or, or, or things that uh, people can use to help uh, store their provenance? Um, so that's a great question and has many, many different answers. So, um, you know, I will mention, I remember that um, uh, the Case Western Data Provenance project uh, that's going on in BDDK right now, Sachi Sahu's group, one of the things that they're actually working on is trying to have forms and, and capture of provenance as doctors see patients. Uh, 
uh, that ends up being something that has to be manually entered. There's been a lot of work in, for instance, you know, digital lab notebooks that uh, use tablets, and one of the opportunities there, although it's still kind of fledgling, is if you have an iPad uh, and there are, for instance, um, uh, barcodes or RFIDs or Bluetooth transponders or various other devices on, uh, for instance, things in the physical world, you can imagine uh, extending your digital lab notebook to record all of those uh, individual things. So as we move to this future Internet of Things world where all of your instruments can talk, I suspect we're going to see more and more um, automatic data acquisition for these kinds of sensors and what was used and so on. Um, again, things like tablets will probably help also as we switch from physical lab notebooks. But unfortunately, there's also no kind of uh, magic wand technology here that's going to completely eliminate uh, the human as kind of the, you know, the conduit for a huge part of that of that knowledge. So that being said, you know, I, I think um, as as particular tasks mature, there probably will be more and more automation of specific steps there. Right. What uh, role do you see librarians and archivists, uh, basically part of the uh, digital archiving community, uh, what, what role can they play in helping scientists and data scientists to, to do this in an effective way? I think that's one of the great opportunities for kind of the library and information science uh, community is really helping to define and uh, and assist with kind of best practices in metadata, potentially actually uh, aiding with the uh, maintenance of archives and, and so on. Um, I will say, you know, from my own interactions with, for instance, our university librarians versus the libraries in other universities, um, it's still very much an open question of uh, just how central libraries are going to be in this picture. I personally think this seems like a, a great role for them uh, and there are a lot of really talented people in those fields who are working broadly in this space and in broadly in digital curation and uh, digital citation and, and so on. Um, so my hope is that that will be among their central roles looking forward um, but it also feels like that is happening for some but not all institutions at this point in time. Great. One final question for you. Uh, is there any way, and perhaps you discussed some of this, but maybe you want to elaborate, is there any way to fingerprint data and its metadata uh, and its provenance uh, in such a way that it's there's a unique identifier, uh, perhaps it's some sort of um, you know, uh, uh, like a hash uh, sort of a number that uh, can be a unique identifier that can also help you to make sure that data hasn't been tampered with or altered in any way? Yeah, so in fact, absolutely, that is the case. Um, there are, you know, many uh, cryptographic hash algorithms that people commonly use over the uh, data uh, to generate unique IDs. Um, sometimes that ID itself uh, is what is shared. Sometimes that data, that ID becomes uh, a kind of signature uh, or certificate on the data. Um, one of the challenges tends to be that, you know, at times those signatures themselves are fairly large. Uh, at times uh, there is a question of how you would create uh, the signature to look up a data item if you don't know all of its fields. Um, so, you know, I think this is an extremely important building block toward that. I think also you know, coming back to the point of um, security, I think one of the other pieces that, that we have to take into account is often I'll acquire some data, I'll do an experiment, I'll produce an output, I might hash or assign that output, then I give it to somebody else who in turn kind of does the same thing and so on. And so really you're building kind of a, you know, if you will, a Russian doll of nested one thing inside of another inside of another. Um, and so, uh, Cryptography helps us tremendously with that, but uh, one of the major challenges there becomes how do you look up the cryptographic key of a particular data item that you know exists 
if you don't have the key in the first place. So it's really important and useful in a, in a critical building block, but one has to realize that also there are some particular use cases that it doesn't support. Okay. Wonderful. Well, Dr. Ives, thank you so much for, for giving us a, a great talk on provenance and, and all that that entails. I want to thank everybody who joined us uh, this morning. And uh, if you do have further questions, I'm sure uh, Dr. Ives, uh, you can f uh, go to his website there and uh, find out uh, how to get in touch with him and ask him your questions. Um, tune in again next week, everyone, for uh, our data science seminar series. Uh, we look forward to having you. Thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you.